Biointensive gardening. Though you may hear different definitions depending on the person using the words, strictly speaking, biointensive gardening is a method of increasing production per square inch by implementing advanced gardening methods, usually using hand tools or walking machines. Some biointensive gardening methods start with double dug beds, which are not ideal. Double dug beds are a method of making soils loose deeper than 12 inches, 30.5 centimeters, which involves digging up the topsoil, reserving it, pitchforking or broadforking the subsoil, and then returning the topsoil back on top. For potatoes, carrots, and many root crops, it makes an immediate difference, though it is energy intensive and negative overall for soil life in comparison to just broad forking. Using a broad fork, which is like a giant pitchfork, to loosen soils is a great way to avoid tilling and double digging. Pitchfork can also be used. Biointensive gardeners mix compost into their topsoils regularly. This gives the soils high amounts of organic matter and soil biology. This allows for close planting which creates a miniature canopy that shades out weeds and keeps in moisture. In addition to a high density of plants per square inch, biointensive farmers focus on their density of calories per square inch. And in recent years, they have been thinking about the amount of carbon sequestered per square inch or centimeter. Sourcing companion planting, crop rotation, new technology, many heirloom seeds, and biological controls of pests where possible Biointensive gardening has many valuable permacultural aspects. Beneficial insect and pollinator habitat. Providing habitat for honeybees isn't just about keeping your honey supply accumulating or helping the bees get through the winter. Bees require the pollen on flowers to survive. We in turn are dependent on the bees for the pollination of much of our food. We are each part of a great hole on with the bees. Recognizing and supporting these pollinator holons supports the whole system. Beneficial insects and pollinators might need specific plants to regularly visit or establish residence in a system. Plants like milkweed for monarch butterflies are superb attractors and critical for their survival. Many beneficial insects that do not pollinate are predators that eat the insects that feed on our plants. When insect populations are in balance, very interesting things can happen with short blooms of pest activity that target weak plants, followed by beneficial insects or birds feeding on those pests and leaving a stronger overall population of plants. This is similar to predator pressure, improving the health of wild grazing herds. Allowing plants to go to seed regularly keeps a diverse offering of pollen available to attract and keep on site as many pollinators as possible. A bug or insect hotel can be made to accommodate beneficial bugs. Each one of these structures is unique to the location, resources available, and insects on site. Bundles of hollow sticks, stacks of rocks, logs with holes in them, and more all provide a home for a particular insect. Sometimes this can make for a buffet for passing birds and managers need to put a screen over the face of the bug hotel, which keeps out birds but lets bugs in, as done on Miracle Farm in Quebec, Canada. Predator insects with such fantastic names as miniature pirate bug, assassin bug, soldier beetle, mealy bug destroyer, and damsel bug can be attracted to the garden. There are many others with less fantastic names as well. Earwig, green lacewing, wasps, some flies, ladybugs, praying mantises, and more. These bugs are primarily attracted to plants in the Apiacea family, carrot, fennel, parsley, celery, cilantro, etc., and the Asteraceae family. Sunflowers, daisies, lettuce, artichokes, calendula, dandelions, dahlias, yarrow, zinnias, etc. Planting a diversity of plants and letting them go to seed is important for pollinators in all the cycles they support and that support them. Irrigation, watering, using well water, always leads to the salting of soils. It often looks like a white film on the leaves and fruit or 
It can even be crusts of salt on the soil when it is severe. Watering with chlorinated municipal water bleaches the soils. Soils have developed in nature to prefer rainwater, which is essentially distilled water, lacking in minerals. Plants have developed to anticipate rains, sensing the rise in humidity, and prepare themselves to accept the moisture. They receive moisture through condensation, precipitation, and groundwater. When we water, we fill up the spaces in the soil, making a temporary anaerobic condition. If we overwater, we can make our soils anaerobic for extended periods of time and stress out our plants. Water as little as possible. Instead, try to create landscapes that gather and hold moisture. If you do have to irrigate, try to use drip line buried under mulch as much as possible to minimize watering and evaporation. Seed saving. While the many techniques and methodologies of seed saving could fill several books, seed saving is rather simple for the most part. To produce seeds with the highest germination rates, plants need to dry down completely and become brown, where all the energy from the plant has gone into the seed, and the remaining portion of the plant is mostly just standing carbon, ready to compost. All sugars and nutrients were focused into the seed's production. The seeds at this point may still need to be dried down further before storing, which can be done in the sun inside or very carefully in a dehydrator, and then only for large, dense seeds like beans and corn. Seeds are kept in a cool, dark place for the next season, or in the refrigerator or freezer for years. Seeds that are centuries old and even millennia old, yet still viable, are being found on archaeological sites and being grown out at universities continuously, proving how amazing seeds are. Some plants, such as cucumbers and melons, need to be isolated from other members of their botanical family. They cross! To keep plants true, hand pollinate, plan, and time accordingly, and use physical barriers like screens or paper bags. Potting soil. We can make our own potting soil at home with just sharp river sand and sieved compost. Though the finer we sieve, the less fungi will survive the process. Sharp river sand is sand that lets water pass through it easily and can be found in the inside bends of rivers, streams, and creeks. Most annuals and perennials. 50% sharp river sand, 50% sieved compost. Tropicals. 40% sharp river sand, 60% sieved compost or more compost. Fine seeds, 90% sand, 10% sieved compost. Rooting plants. We can take cuttings of trees, perennials, and even annuals like loche squash from Peru or tomatoes and encourage them to form roots so we can grow an exact replica of that plant, sometimes referred to as cloning. There are a number of ways to do this. Some plants such as willow, grape, and fig are naturally adept at rooting from cuttings, but others, like many hardwoods, are more stubborn and need coaxing and time. Using willow water and compost tea, we can sparingly water the cuttings keeping them moist in a greenhouse system with intermittent misters, planting them in a container of river sand that drains well. Keeping them warm, highly nourished, and moist, but not wet, will encourage them to put out strong roots. Grafting. Grafting is the art of taking a cutting from one tree and growing it onto the cut branch of another tree. This can create an all season tree where each branch has a different ripening time period. So you can have early, mid and late season fruit all on one tree. It is ideal for small areas, orchardists or anyone looking to turn pruning cuttings into new trees. Every pruning from a fruit tree can be grafted onto a rootstock or an already established tree's branch to diversify yields. You can have one citrus tree with lemons, citrus limon, limes, citrus arantifolia, and mandarin oranges, citrus reticulata, on it, or one tree with a dozen different types of apple. Rootstocks are chosen for their vigorousness, disease resistance, and hardiness. They can also be linked to fruit size and early fruiting. 
This is how it is possible to have dwarf and non-dwarf trees of the same variety. Different rootstock. Pears, pyrus, grafton to quince, sedonia, oblonga, rootstock to save time since quince trees don't take as long to mature as pears, which can take 20 years. Plums, prunus rootstocks can support graft from all other prunus varieties. Peaches, nectarines, apricots, and other plums. Trees don't all readily graft onto each other. Most are done within the same family. It is both an art and a science. Some use grafting tools that work like scissors, while others use traditional grafting knives that are extremely sharp. There are several different styles of cut though. The main idea is to have the bark from the cutting or scoring and the rootstock touch. The pieces can range in size from six to eight inches, 15 to 20 centimeters, section of branch or larger to a small one to two inch, 2.5 to five centimeters section of branch bench grafting to just a cut out bud from another plant, bud grafting. When finished with a new graft, you can tie on or leave a final top branch for birds to land on. Otherwise, your fragile grafting can be ruined by any passing bird. At Miracle Farms in Quebec, they use rubber bands to keep the graft stable and they seal off exposed wood with wood putty as pictured. Sepp Holzer has recently introduced a new concept called regrafting, where commercial varieties are grafted with wild native varieties for higher yields, better taste, and disease resistance. Recently, Sepp included this in a design in southwest Spain with wild avocados, which were outperforming the commercial orchards. It is like rewilding applied to grafting. Stratification or scarification of seed. Seeds are protective containers of genetic material. Many seeds only sprout when they sense that conditions are exactly right. A soaked pea will sprout on concrete, while a blueberry or nectarine seed in the same situation will stubbornly resist sprouting until it becomes non-viable. Stratification. Winter seed dormancy can be broken by spending a short period of time in colder temperatures in a refrigerator, soaking in cold water overnight, or even outdoors. Vernalization. Some seeds require a longer cold period in the refrigerator or outdoors to simulate a full two to three month winter. Scarification. Some seeds need to be stressed to germinate through either heat or physical action like sandpaper scratching, fire, or nicking a corner with a knife. Pruning. While there is much debate over pruning in general, pruning can help control growth, determine shape, and stimulate fruit growth. When pruned, many fruit trees like apples, stone fruit, and mulberries respond with an increase in fruit production. They panic and start producing over time. The timing of pruning is critical. Most fruit trees prefer winter pruning, but not all, so do your research. When pruning, a classic method is to remove intersecting branches to prevent them from rubbing each other and damaging the bark. This also allows for airflow. Small branches are removed from within 6 to 8 inches, 15 to 20 centimeters of the trunk, leaving only large branches and a relatively open area. Some growers use wires to hold the branches down after pruning for a couple of months. After this, they may grow downward below the horizon, which stimulates fruiting. After this, they may grow downward less vertically or at horizontal, which stimulates fruiting. The orchidists make sure to not leave the ties on the tree for longer than that, or else the tree may start to grow around the wire. Other growers are tying branches to the branch itself or to the trunk in early spring for a few weeks or a month to stimulate bud growth. There are many different methods of pruning and training fruit trees, and many new combinations and methods are being trialed regularly. For those that do not prune, they commonly control vegetative growth by pulling the branches down below the horizon line and holding them there for a month or two in late winter early spring. This stimulates fruit growth instead of overall branch, trunk, and leaf growth. It channels the energy that would have gone into vertical vegetative growth into the fruit. Unpruned fruit tree arms weighed down with fruit tend to develop a drooping habit as well, as do trees with vines on them or late winter snow. Unpruned branches 
can touch the drip line of a tree, intercepting critters that would have eaten the roots or bark of trees with pruned branches. Many argue that parasites from the soil can be transmitted this way, but the growers using this method focus on parasite and disease resistant varieties. Orchardists who do not prune often cite vigor as the reason why. Vigor is caused by overwatering, over fertilizing, and over pruning. The sap that returns in spring is based on the quantity of branches, buds, and leaves that the tree had the season before. If the extra sap is a moderate amount, it can go into bud growth and form larger and more numerous fruits. But too much sap can turn into vigor, out of control vegetative growth, which can lead to increased disease, weaker plants, and poor yields. This is why orchardists graft onto dwarf rootstock, it's non-vigorous. The branches that are grafted on are usually from vigorous varieties, especially if they are heirloom. Trees want to turn water or nutrients into vigor and vegetative growth. In wet climates with heavy soils, no swales are needed for a line of trees on contour to act like a swale. A swale would create too much water and endless vigor. Chop and drop. Chopping and dropping weeds in place works wonderfully with weeds of all kinds. Chop them before they go to seed to generate organic matter for the soil. Because weeds are reparative mechanisms, accumulating specific nutrients to remediate the soils, they are excellent mulch if cut before they can propagate. They will continue to re-sprout from their root systems to provide more mulch for a period of time before they get exhausted and die. They also don't require any room or spacing. They use every available space, profusely packing in. Pulling weeds up by the roots undoes the work they are doing and simply causes more aggressive weeds to show up. Some weeds are noxious, poisonous, or have incredible, or have incredible thorns. These can be undesirable, even as mulch. They can sometimes be called invasive, though that term gets often misapplied. Because weeds are pH and nitrate dependent, using fungal dominant compost tea applications will weaken weeds enough that chopping and dropping will remove them. Otherwise, using animals is a powerful reset for stubborn plants such as blackberries. The home plant nursery. A small plant nursery at home can save money, grow a greater diversity of plants, and add another source of revenue to the homestead through plant sales and eventually the products of a food forest. Rooting out cuttings from prunings is a great way to capitalize on a free resource, a natural return of surplus. Growing trees, perennials, and annuals from seed in a controlled environment like a greenhouse allows for homesteaders to generate more plants than they can use on their homestead within a few seasons. Small greenhouses equipped with misters connected to hoses on timers provides an easy way to start your own home plant nursery. Plant breeding. While it can fill several books with its intricacies, plant breeding can also be a very simple and profitable hobby. Many garden plants have obvious male and female parts, see pictures, that are easily hand pollinated and then sealed off with tape or with a paper bag. When both a male and female flower are just about to bloom, usually the night before, remove the petals of a male flower and cut it free. Open up the female flower, use the male flower like a paintbrush on the female flower, and then seal the flower shut. This can be done with corn, tomatoes, squash, and melons easily, and with the aid of a microscope, smaller flowers. While it is true that Mendel's inheritance chart works well with simplistic genes like those found in peas, it does not work with other reproductive genetic arrangements. Potatoes, for instance, are much more complex in the way they reproduce genetically, and for that reason, they can reproduce either asexually, vegetatively, from their tubers, or sexually via flowers, bees, and small tomato-like fruits. Most commercial varieties of potatoes rarely flower, but heirloom potatoes can mostly be relied on to flower. One can have a lot of fun breeding and creating land races by allowing for open crosses and then selecting the best each year. This is primarily how all plants have been bred for human use, but many are a bit more mysterious and complex. Studying the works of Carol Depp will give you an in-depth perspective of the wild world of breeding plants for a purpose. Her most in-depth work is Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties, 1993.